Hello everyone, and welcome back to AP Biology. So in this lecture, I'm going to go over uh, the, the effect of speciation. In our last lecture, we went over the evolution of populations. Well, this segues perfectly into that. And what I want to do is talk about how a new species is actually created. This is what Darwin was trying to figure out when he filmed his uh, Origin of Species. Okay, I'm sorry, when he wrote his Origin of Species. And so really, where does the Origin of Species start? And what we're going to explore is a lot of reproductive barriers that come into play. But a big thing that we're going to talk about in this lecture is there's going to be allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation, two different forms of creating a new species. The first one deals with a geographic barrier, right? So an allopatric species is like you're from another country. The two species have separated hundreds of years later. We start to see that they become something else and they can't mate and reproduce viable fertile offspring. However, in sympatric speciation, the two species, the one species actually splits into two while living in the same geographic region. What could happen? Well, we're going to go into detail about that, but these are the two big things, reproductive barriers and the types of speciation. So let's start taking a look at this. Okay, so um, actually before we do, I wanted to talk about the pictures here. I almost forgot. Uh, this right here is what happens when you mix a donkey and a zebra, which we call a zonkey. Now this is really important that they're not a new species. Everybody in this picture here, all three of them, are sterile. They can't have offspring of their own. So we call this a post-zygotic barrier, and it, it leads to reduced fertility, okay? So all three of these, every time you make one, they're going to be uh, sterile. So the zonkey is sterile. This is a lion and a tiger mixed together. They're sterile. And then finally, if I put a horse and a zebra together, you get what they call a zebroid, and they're also sterile. They're hybrids, they're not new species. So if I were to put two zebroids together, leave them in a barn, let them mate, they will never produce any offspring. They'll mate, but they'll never produce any offspring. So hybrids are not gonna be included here. Okay, so let's take a look. So the first thing is, let's explore the reproductive barriers. There's a lot. The top shelf right here shows us all things that happened before sperm and egg fused to become a zygote. We call these pre-zygotic barriers. Anything on the bottom is going to be post-zygotic barriers, okay? And just looking at this really quickly, we have habitat isolation or habitat barrier, temporal isolation, behavioral isolation. Then there's a mating attempt. Once we have the mating attempt, there's mechanical isolation. Oh, we'll talk about that. Gametic isolation. Once we have fertilization and we get over here, these are the post-zygotic barriers. We have reduced hybrid viability, reduced hybrid fertility, and a hybrid breakdown. So let's take a look over here at reproductive isolation. These are factors that affect whether or not two species will actually produce these fertile healthy offspring or viable offspring and so we broke it down into two barriers let's start over here with habitat isolation okay habitat isolation will come first and i'll always refer to this list when we're doing the prezygotic barriers so here's the first thing these this is a great example when the habitats are split so if i think about a tiger and a lion lions mostly come from africa tigers mostly come from let's say india or southeast asia the two giant cats will never mate with each other because they have a huge ocean separating them. That's habitat isolation. What humans have done, though, is brought them together and say, hey, what happens when we do that? And so this means that they are separated by different ecosystems, okay? Let's give you an example here. These two species, this used to be one species, and slowly they broke down and lived in different habitats. This one always lives in the water, lays their eggs on land, but mostly spends all the day in the water, cools off, while this one over here lives on land. The fact that they're in different habitats, they probably will never meet and they'll never mate. So this is the first and most common type of reproductive barrier. Let's take a look at the next. Okay, it's talking reproductive isolation temporal. Temporal just means that you made at different mating seasons. So here I have two different skunks, the east skunk, which is found on the eastern coast of the United States, and the west skunk. The two different skunk species actually made at different times of year. This one likes to mate in the early spring, while this one likes to mate in the late summer. And so this is huge. Temporal isolation, the mating season actually is when your circadian rhythms kick in, you have this biological clock says it's time to mate. You might even go to a system called estrus if you're a female, where your reproductive organs start to swell. You can't control that. That's what your species does. So if they're two separate species and they have different uh, temporal periods or mating times, this will this will show up and so they can't become a different species. Behavior plays another role. 
Sometimes two species will come together and they'll want to mate. But if they have the wrong courtship ritual, talking about maybe if you're a bird and you sing a different song, or maybe if you're a booby, okay, this is the blue-footed booby, you'll do a different dance, okay? The blue-footed booby has a very specific dance that it does that shows that, look, I'm the same species, okay? So the male comes over to the female, he gets one chance, and what he does is says, look, I got blue feet. Blue feet, blue beak. Blue feet, blue beak. It's such a simple dance, but if he messes it up, and he's doing the dance, right? She looks pretty bored in this picture, but if she likes the dance, they begin to mate. If she doesn't, she's scared because maybe you're a different species. I don't want to mate with a different species. I'm going to invest all my resources on somebody I know I'm going to have offspring with. Some of them I'm going to have very healthy offspring. Okay, and so this is a great picture of that. Um, the courting dance or the pointing display. Beautiful. Now, mechanical isolation just deals with the gonads and the sex organs. Do they, are they compatible with one another? I love this picture of these two snails because what happens is, this one over here has a, a, a shell that goes this way, and the other one has a shell that goes this way. So it's like actually opposites, and because they're opposites, they can't line up their sex organs perfectly so that they can actually exchange gametes. And so mechanically, it doesn't work. They won't mate. That's actually a reproductive barrier or reproductive isolation. Another example would be, let's say the animal is just too big, like if I took like a bear and a dog, never would happen, or even a hamster, let's think of about a bear and a hamster, they could never mate, because mechanically he can never really get his gametes into the female, and so this makes sense. But let's say you lived on the water, and you had gametic isolation. Underwater, everybody does external fertilization, unless you're a mammal. So the fish, the sea urchins, the amphibians, they're all shooting out clouds of sperm, they're all releasing eggs. What's to stop frog sperm from trying to fertilize fish eggs? Well, it's real simple. The two gametes will not fuse together. This is called gametic isolation. And so sperm and egg do not fuse. What we see in this picture are two different species of sea urchin that somehow be near, that are actually next to each other. And their sperm and eggs don't fuse together. Therefore, you don't get a new species, no speciation. Now we get to after you make a zygote. So I was showing a picture over here of what happens when you get a mule, right? This is just a donkey and a, um, and a, and a horse put together. Okay, so reduced hybrid viability. These are two species of salamander that actually made it. And as amphibians, they had external fertilization. They released their sperm into the water. The eggs fused with it. But how come this guy is so sick and weak? All their offspring that come out are all sick and weak looking, right? With his white hands. Well, anyway, this is an example of that. The offspring don't live long enough to actually mate themselves, and so you don't create a new species. Okay, whatever this hybrid is, is just really weak and sick, never gets to mate with some other hybrid of its own species, and so they die. We don't call it a new species. The, the speciation has stopped. Another barrier, now this is the one we were talking about. Put a horse and a, a donkey together and you get a mule. However, everybody knows that all mules, and these guys are very popular in South America, all the mules are sterile. They can't reproduce. If you put two mules together, you won't get anything. Every time you need to make a new mule, you gotta bring another horse and a donkey together. They do say that if you put the male donkey with the female horse, it's beautiful because you make the best mule. The mule is great because you get best of both worlds, the donkey is really smart, and he's very strong, but he's lazy. The horse is not smart, but he's strong too, but not as strong as this guy, but he's a hard worker. And so if you could put the hard working ethic of this guy, the strength and the smarts of this guy, you have actually one of the best organisms you can ever have, because he's hard working, he's strong, he's not stubborn, he does what you want to do. You can get him to climb a mountain for you. He can fit through little tiny footpaths that a horse couldn't. So mules have their use. However, they are not a new species. There is no genus and species that, that we would name them, and so they're just considered hybrids. Okay, no speciation done here. Finally, we have hybrid breakdown. Mostly with plants is the best examples for this. This is a type of watercress plant. So the first generation, we put two different watercress species together and we got this beautiful hybrid. We made it the hybrid with another hybrid. And second generation came around and we got this. Hmm, that's as tall as it grew. So then we did it again. We took the second generations and put them together and we made this. 
So what's happening is the hybrid begins to break down after a few generations. When that happens, you didn't make a new species. That doesn't happen with most species, right? You shouldn't have hybrid breakdown where the breakdown starts to happen. They get weaker and weaker. Never this. And so for this reason, this would be the last stop of speciation. If you could get past all those barriers, including this one, now speciation has taken over. So here's just an example that I found. If I were to take a grizzly bear and a polar bear together, you get this awesome thing called a grolar bear, right? And yeah, he's used on display. He's not really something that you find in the wild so much because they, they live in different latitudes, but a great example of a hybrid. This is what I would call the reduced hybrid fertility. The hybrid is not sick. He actually lives to a very long age. The only problem is he can never reproduce. All right, so speciation. So making a new species can happen in two ways. One way is where we have allopatric speciation, where this whole land gets divided, and what? We made a new species of tree. Nothing happened to this species, sympatric speciation, but out of nowhere, for whatever reason, maybe polyploidy, maybe niche separation, we got a new species of tree show up based on these parents, okay? Something happened with the chromosomes. Let's take a look. So the first one I was talking about is allopatric speciation. Here I have two species of chipmunk that have been separated by a geographic barrier, the Grand Canyon. Now this is a beautiful thing because Grand Canyon was around for thousands of years. These two chipmunks were probably at one time one species. They all shared the same land. But because of this impact, right, they say that a meteor, or actually this was done by erosion, right, uh, created this big valley. Now these two guys never ever get to meet and they have a geographic barrier in front of them, hence the new species, okay? So that's how I think of this. Allo means other, Patrick means country, other country. Sympatric doesn't mean that. Sympatric means same country. So what could possibly happen? All right, so look at this species of bug over here. Imagine that all of them were born in, let's call these mangoes, okay? All of them lay their eggs in the mangoes. They're born in mangoes. They have imprinting on mangoes. When they, come, when they become adults and they mate, they lay their eggs in mangoes. But let's say a disease hit all the mango trees. There were enough mangoes to go around. Well, what do we do during mating season? Oh, somebody found a banana. Well, I don't know about bananas. I never, I never made it on a banana, but fine, let's do it. Let's lay our eggs on the banana. When the babies are born, they're going to imprint on the banana and say, okay, I was born in a banana. I, uh, when I was a larva, I supplied my food with, uh, with banana. I want my kids to be born on bananas. And so before you know it, they all the offspring from this pair start laying their eggs on bananas. Over time, they separated their niche. Their niche was to lay the eggs on the, on the mango. And now they're doing two different fruits. When this happens, slowly the two species, oh, I'm sorry, slowly the one species separates into two. Okay, we've seen this also with a type of wasp that used to prefer figs. And then when the fig trees got a little disease, they moved over to dates. And so the ones that stayed with the figs are one species, and the one with the dates, they became another species. Okay, and that's what we're seeing over here. Okay, similarly, this one goes for oak trees. This one goes for conifers. Okay, these two types of bugs, same exact idea. Niche separation, one way. Another way that you could do this is called autopolyploidy, right? This is where an individual has more than two sets of chromosomes. Polyploidy, we're going to go over in a little bit later, another lecture. But this is when you have more than a normal number of chromosomes, okay? So something happened in meiosis. So for example, you had your mitosis, but it didn't split correctly. So now you have 4N. So when you did your meiosis, your gametes were 2N when they should have been N. And so, as a result, you get this 4N offspring. It survives. Again, plants mostly do polyploidy. We don't really see this with animals so much. It's pretty lethal in animals. But when there's a mistake, some non-disjunction event where the chromosomes don't separate properly during meiosis or mitosis, we get this result. And so that's another one. It's a genetic component. And so lastly, okay, we get a sterile hybrid becomes a, a, a fertile hybrid at this point. For example, we have something called the double rose, or we have the double tulip. This looks great because this gives us a great sounding board for sympatric speciation, okay? So two ways sympatric speciation can occur. One, you separate it to a completely different niche, or two, during your meiosis or mitosis, there was some sort of error in the chromosome number, and another chromosome number came about, and as a result, your gametes fused with something else, and you got an offspring with an abnormal chromosome number, a type of polyploidy.
All right, guys, so this concludes our lecture on uh, lecture number four on AP Biology and Speciation. In our next lecture, we're going to go over to the history of the Earth, and we're going to talk about taxonomy, and where exactly do we get the names of organisms, and bring up Linnaeus, and so forth. But uh, until next time, guys, keep on reading your textbook. The, 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 the standards have changed. The textbooks are thinner. However, the, the input and the reading is still just as strong. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Be safe.